Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for watching my podcasts here on Patreon, supporting the channel the way you do, and for watching the videos on YouTube and Vidme. I'm super grateful that you do that. Now, there's one additional thing that you can do that would help Gun Guy TV a lot, and it won't cost you a dime. And uh, other than sharing and telling other people about it, you can shop Amazon through our affiliate link. So if you're going to shop Amazon anyway, if you've got something you want to buy from Amazon, if you'll go to Gun Guy TV's website first and click on the little banner that says Amazon on the top, that will take you to the Amazon website through our affiliate link. Everything remains the same for you. The price is the same. Your prime uh, shipping, all the shipping stuff, all works the same. Nothing changes from your point of view. It's just that Amazon sees that you came through, uh, through us to your website, and as an affiliate, they'll pay us a little commission. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that's a, it's one extra step for you, but other than that, everything else is the same. All you have to do is go to our website. You can get there by going to gunguy.tv, or if you like, gunguytv.com or gunguytv.net. It'll all take you there. Click on the little banner, shop to your heart's content, buy anything you want on Amazon. You could buy furniture, toilet paper, cheese, doesn't matter, and we'll get a little commission from that. It does help us quite a bit to keep the channel going and to keep the channel growing. So thank you very much for your support. I appreciate it. All right, let's talk about churches. I got to get a little drink of coffee here because I got a little bit of a sore throat. Somebody commented about this cup the other day. Yes, it says, in a perfect world, you could hunt on golf courses. <laughs> I don't play golf, so but I do hunt, so it would work very well for me. I got it. Uh, I think I got this cup at the Bass Pro Shop in Las Vegas when I was at SHOT Show last year. Or maybe it was a year before, but I think I, I, think I got it. Every year I go buy a cup. Uh, from Bass Pro because I always have unique ones. So I've got a collection of the things, and that's one of them that I got from there. All right, churches. Now, when it comes to church security, this is a, uh, obviously a top of mind because of some things that have happened recently. We had in September, I believe, the uh, shooting at the little church in Antioch, Tennessee, if I remember correctly, uh, where a you know, fellow walked in there and shot up the church and, and uh, caused great injury and pain. And then I think it was a little Baptist church, and then, uh, or maybe not, I don't know. Anyway, maybe it was a Church of Christ, but it doesn't really matter. And then they had the one in Texas um, that was just, boy, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, and 26 people were killed. I think that was the Baptist church. But again, the denomination doesn't matter. The fact is Christians are under assault around the world, regardless of denomination, and crazy people and people with hate in their heart sometimes walk into churches and shoot them up. And I have for years predicted to my clients, I do have some churches and church organizations that are clients of mine, I've predicted to them that somebody's going to walk into an American church and shoot it full of holes or blow it up sooner or later. And now it's beginning to happen. I, you know, there's many times I've predicted things and hoped I was wrong. And this was one of them. But I'm not wrong. I do have some expertise in this field because I own a company that both trains security officers throughout the state of California. I think at this point we have about 16,000 students, something like that. We've been at it for, I want to say 10 years, but I'd have to look at the calendar. It's either nine and a half or 10 years, something like that. And then I also do some consulting for specifically for churches in helping them develop security staffs, training the security staffs, and so on. In fact, this Saturday I'll be at one of my clients' churches uh, for the quarterly training that they do with me, uh, teaching and training their security staff there. So I know a little bit about this, and as a result, uh, I get calls about it a lot. There are a number of things that are dilemmas faced by churches when it comes to defending the church against unlawful violence. One is the, simply the, the spiritual argument or the theological argument as to whether a Christian should defend himself or herself, whether a church should actually have armed people in church. And folks will fall on one side or the other side of that argument or somewhere in the middle. And if you want to know about the specifics of those things, I did write an article entitled, Should a Christian Defend Himself? And, uh, and that is actually on the Gun Guy TV website, and it covers some of the scriptures I've found on the subject. Uh, obviously, I'm not a minister, theologian, priest, or whatever, so I'm just, a, I'm just a lay person, but I do read my Bible, and that's what I came up with. I, you know, could be right, could be wrong, but so far, those are the convictions that I have. And if you'd like to read that article, you can go to the description for this podcast, and you'll find a link right to it. So you can take a, take a look at that if you'd like. Then there's also, you know, once a church has resolved that, yeah, it's okay to have armed people at church, then there's the how-to. How, how do we do that? And there's several different ways you can do it. 
you can ask for volunteers to arm themselves, particularly if you have a large or fairly large contingent of retired law enforcement or current law enforcement in your congregation. Sometimes they'll be willing to come to the church armed, and the current law enforcement are current law enforcement. Regardless of whether they're local, state, or federal, they're still law enforcement, and if somebody comes in to try to do harm, they're going to step up and do something about it because, well, they're supposed to. They're law enforcement. When you have retired law enforcement, well, they, because of the LEOSA law, H.R. 218, they're, they're able to carry in their retirement all throughout the country. So even if you're in a very restrictive state like California or New Jersey, retired law enforcement officers can still carry in those states and certainly can carry at church. Then you get into the whole concealed carry thing. Some churches have said, well, I think I'm going to, we don't have a lot of law enforcement folks, so we're going to ask our congregation if they'd like to, to go get a concealed carry permit and feel free to bring the gun to church and carry a church. And if you're in a small congregation, that makes that might make sense, provided they have some training so that they're not, you know, they really can hit what they shoot at and so on. By the way, that might also apply to the cops too. I've, I, some cops, I got to tell you, I've, I've trained a few of them, and if I'm standing still, I'm perfectly safe when they're shooting at me because I can't hit what they're shooting at. So that's, you know, you want to make sure that people actually are skilled with the tool that they have. So that is also a way of looking at it. And with smaller churches, that seems to work because you've got a congregation that's small enough that everybody pretty much knows everybody. You get a little, little church with a congregation of 100 people or maybe even 200 people or less, 25, 50 people. Yeah, everybody knows everybody. So if somebody stands up with a gun to defend against somebody who just walked in the place with a gun, everybody knows the person who just stood up is a defender because everybody knows that, uh, that Fred over there is a retired cop and that John over there is a uh, highway patrolman and that, uh, uh, that uh, Sally over there is a border patrol agent. Everybody knows them. But when you're in a church, a mega church or a big church that's got three, 4,000 people in attendance on Sunday, that becomes a whole different proposition because now if somebody walks in and starts shooting a place and, and, and people pop up like daisies with guns all over the place, you don't know who the bad guy is and who the good guy is. And that can be a real dilemma to figure that out. Uh, and, uh, and it's entirely possible that good guys could be shooting at good guys, or for that matter, that an established armed security team could be shooting at a, at a, at a, a member of the church or a visitor at the church who happens to be armed that's standing up trying to help. So you have to have some coordination there, and those are things to think about too. There's also the issue of the fact that if a gun starts going off in a room with 3,000 people or even 400 people, it's going to be pandemonium. There's going to be people dodging, running, diving, hiding, but there's going to be people moving all over the place. You have to ask yourself, under what circumstances can I use a firearm in that environment and not run the risk of inadvertently hitting an innocent person? So there, there's the other issue. So there's all kinds of things that come into to play. Part of, them, part of those things are, how do we actually institute a defensive posture and a defensive plan? And the other thing is, once we've done so, how do we implement it? So I have clients who, for example, uh, don't have a security team per se, but they have a law enforcement ministry. And they've got enough law enforcement people in their church that they have law enforcement people reaching out to law enforcement people, and they use that as their established security team because these folks are all trained. They know who they are. They know who each other are. They, you know, they get together in the same Bible study group and so on. So if something happens at church, uh, they, they just take over. Uh, the, the problem with that is that sometimes... Um, if they're not there, <laughs> certain of them aren't there because of the shift they're working or they're on vacation or whatever. Your, your team is a little bit smaller and you can't manage it that well because it's volunteers. Some larger churches actually employ people on the weekends. They take church members and they vet them and they train them. And some of them are, many of them are former law enforcement, some are not. And they get them trained up and vetted and they train together and they study together. And they have guys like me who are trainers come in periodically and train them. They do all that kind of work. And then they manage the schedule of these folks because they're actually employees in their retirement and they're working, you know, potentially part time as retired employees to do the job. So you have that approach as well. Where it becomes very challenging when you first start is when you try to get, when you've gotten past the theological argument and the church has agreed that yes, it needs to happen. Now you have to get past the attention span or lack of attention span on the issue on the part of the ministry staff. Because the ministry staff oftentimes are focused on the ministry. They're focused on the outreach. They're focused on the things that the ministry is doing. And they don't want to worry about that whole security thing. That's, that's, uh, you guys worry about that. 
Well, the problem with that, without the is that without the buy-in of the ministry staff, you may not have the buy-in of the board of the church and leadership of the church, or you have a disconnect in how things are done or when things are done. You have security people who would like to lock the place down, completely secure it, and not let anybody in or out. That's pretty severe, <laughs> a little over the top. You have the ministry staff who wants to let everybody in or out, or everybody's available, and oh my goodness, we want to save all the souls. So even that guy with a gun, let him in. <laughs> you, know, you got that problem. And everything in between. So it can become a very challenging thing to secure a church. It's not like securing a corporate building where you can lock up certain parts of it, secure certain parts of it, and so on. A church is a very porous thing. Uh, people who you don't know are invited all the time. You don't have to have a pass to come in. You know, we're not in the business. You know, churches are not in the business of turning people away from Christ. In fact, if anything, they want visitors to come. Churches are not in the business of, of ignoring or turning away people who are troubled, who have mental health issues or who have psychological issues or just need some help. We, we don't, you know, churches don't turn those folks away. They want to help them. They want to work with them. They want to do what they, they can do to help them spiritually and in every other way. And so churches can be very welcoming, and at the same time, that makes them very vulnerable. As a result, securing a church is not an absolute and it can be a very challenging thing to do. Uh, I find in my own church it's very challenging to do, and with my clients that is also the case. So if you're going to a church and you're thinking about putting together a security team of some sort, these are some of the things that you have to worry about right out of the gate. And I'll talk about some more specifics in the next segment. Now, if you haven't already gotten yourself some sort of legal backup to defend you in the case of you having to use a firearm to defend yourself, whether that's at home or you're a concealed carrier or at work or whatever, you're still going to have some legal issues. And it, and it really doesn't matter what state you're in. Some are worse than others. California is absolutely awful where this is concerned, where you can be sued by the thug family of the thug you shot or shot or so, sued by the criminal himself or herself because they survived rather than dying. I mean, you can, even though they came in your building and threatened you with a, with a deadly weapon, they can still sue you. And sometimes they still win. So you want to have some sort of legal support. Now, the company that I use to defend my family is the one you see on your screen, and that is Second Call Defense. I use Second Call Defense because they front the money ahead of time, and I'm not a rich man. I cannot afford to sell my house and give up everything I own in order to pay the lawyers. I need a company that's going to pay the lawyers up front so that I don't have to. Many of these companies don't do that. They require you to foot the bill ahead of time, and if you are successful in defending yourself, then they'll reimburse you. Second call defense does not do that. They front the money ahead of time. If they lose it, they lose it. If you don't succeed in defending yourself, you don't succeed. It is what it is. If they succeed, great. Then they get reimbursed by their insurance company. That's a much better program as far as I'm concerned. So that's why I signed up for second call defense. I urge you to check them out and do the same. They're the company I've chosen to defend my family, and that's why I suggest them as the company to defend yours. Now, moving on with the whole church security thing, I remind you that if you do nothing, if you're in a church and you do nothing, that you're in a position where you might end up looking like these folks, or you might end up looking like these folks, or you might end up looking like the church that's going to get shot up next. I hate to predict it, but we all know it's going to happen. And if that's the case, you don't want it to be you. To a very great degree, church security is not necessarily about stopping the violence. It's about preventing it in the first place because criminals like everybody else, even the crazy ones, tend to choose path of, paths of least resistance. That's why the whole gun-free zone thing, to me, is the most, as a, as a security professional who's been in this business a long time, gun-free zone just spells out killing field target of opportunity, safe place for a murderer to go and kill as many people as possible. That's what a gun-free zone is. Now, if you want to call it a gun-free zone and you want to surround it with police officers who are armed, okay, cool, I'm good. But if you want to call it a gun-free zone and stick one cop on a school campus, for example, of 3,000 students or 5,000 students or 8,000 students that covers two, you know, three-quarters of a mile, uh, that's nuts because that, that cop cannot run fast enough to get from one end of the, of the campus to the other end of the campus to do any good. Unless that officer just happens to be in the right place at the right time, it's nothing but a, then that individual is nothing more than a scarecrow and not capable of doing anything. So gun-free zones are just targets of opportunity. 
the idea of a, as a church is you want to make yourself a non-target of opportunity. You want to make sure that you, as a church organization, are a little bit harder target than the church down the street. Look, that sounds terrible. I'm going, oh, you know, do me a favor, would you, you madman? Go shoot the congregation up down the street. Don't come shoot up mine. Well, that's essentially the message that you're saying. You're, you're sending is go someplace else. If you come in here, you're not going to accomplish your goal. We're going to stop you, and you're probably going to end up dead. When you have a strong security presence, it doesn't have to be highly visible. It just It's going to get out there because people are going to know. If you have a strong security presence, chances are nobody's going to come shoot up your church because you have a strong security presence. They're going to go into the church that they know doesn't. That's, that's how it works. You'll notice in two of these instances, the one in Texas and the one in, uh, in uh, Tennessee, if I read the articles right, in both cases, the, folk, the, 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 the nuts who walked in and shot up the place had some connection to the church in some way. Either they had a connection to the church directly because they had attended it in the past, or they had a connection with someone who did attend it with whom they had a serious problem, and they wanted to go hurt that person. Well, there you are. They, they know just intuitively by just knowing a little bit about it, that there's nobody to stop them there. And as a result, that's where they go. On the other hand, if they have a connection with your church and they're now a disgruntled former member and they know that you have a strong security staff, unless they want to commit suicide very quickly, they're probably not going to show up and try to shoot up the place. In the same way, if they're connected to a person who attends your church, they're going to know just by being around that person for any length of time that the church they attend is very secure. And if they want to hurt that person, they're going to do some, something. They're going to go hurt that person someplace else. They're not going to do it at church and shoot up the church because the church has a strong security staff that's armed. So, so much of this is really uh, creating an environment that is less desirable for this kind of nutty behavior so that they don't attack your church. They go find a target of opportunity where it's the barrier of, of uh, the barrier is not so high. They're going to go find the, the target of, you know, the target of greatest opportunity. That's what criminals do. In the same way, we used to teach people the, the three L's of securing their house, lights, locks, and landscaping. If your house is well lit up at night, if you have great locks and your landscaping is trimmed back so people can't hide behind it to jimmy a door or jimmy a window or work on something like that, then your house is less desirable to a criminal than the house down the street, which is pitch dark at night, has lousy locks, and the landscaping is overgrown. Where are they going to go? They're going to go the, They're going to take the path of least resistance. And even lunatics do that. Even crazy people who go do horrible things and violent things do that. They, they follow the path of least resistance. So the idea behind church security is like church security anywhere, is to put, to put a barrier there and present more resistance to this kind of violence than they would perhaps encounter at the church on the other side of town. Now, if all the churches would get together and agree on this and we could do this, then guess what? you know, they would probably stop shooting up churches. They'd find something else because they know they're not going to be successful in churches. But we're always going to have churches who refuse to do this because theologically or perhaps or, or uh, they just don't feel like it's appropriate. They don't feel like it's the Christian thing to do. You're also going to have the folks who just have their head in the sand and say, no, this is never going to happen here. It doesn't happen here. We're perfectly safe. We're a small town of 400 people. In Texas, and we only have a small congregation. This is a little town. Nobody shoots up a church in a little town. Yeah, well, they just did. 26 people lost their lives. Now, prayerfully, they were walking with the Lord. Amen? And, they, and we know where they are now, if that's the case. But nevertheless, their lives here on earth are ended. Radically, fast, violently, horribly, by some lunatic. And this is what we want to try to avoid. So if you're going to a church and it isn't secure and you have no security presence there, keep in mind that that church is the path of least resistance. Your church is the path of least resistance, and that is not the best plan for you. A better plan is to develop some sort of security presence, however you're going to do it, so that you're not the path of least resistance. As I said, there's many different ways to do it. You can do it through volunteers. You can do it with staff. You're going to have more uh, control over staff and less control over volunteers. So just be aware of that. But some people have the budget. Some churches have the budget and some churches don't. And I think that's where we get into this little last piece of it. And I have said this to churches 
and it sounds like a rude thing to say to a church, but I've said it to businesses too, when they ask me about, can, can we secure my church? What can, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And they'll ask me for a proposal, and they ask me to update the proposal, and they ask me for more information. They'll call me and want to pick my brain. And I say, look, here's the deal. Okay, I want to help. I'm a Christian. It's a mission for me to help churches be more secure. But the fact is, unless you're willing to put a budget toward it, you're not putting your money where your mouth is. You're not ready to do anything. So at some point, if that's where you're at, then you want to make sure that you, you know, you know, that you've had that conversation, that you're really prepared to be serious about it. So those are some of the things that face churches when they're trying to put together a security effort. It does make it astoundingly difficult to accomplish anything because, like I said, you've got those various different arguments in place. And then, of course, you know, you've got some legal beagle things. If you're in states like California, can we actually have armed people at church? What laws do we have to obey? We're Christians. We want to obey the laws. That's what the Bible requires us to do and what Christ calls us to do is submit to the authorities and obey the laws. So we want to do that and do what we're going to do legally. Well, the more restrictive the state, the more challenging that's going to be for your church to secure it itself. And that's, that's something that you want to think about, too. I would say that if you can find the legal hurdles and you can overcome them, the sooner you start working on it, the sooner you'll have those overcome and the sooner your church will be safer. In the meantime, there are some other steps you can take to try to be a little safer in your church. And one would be, as I said, find out if you have any retired or active duty law enforcement folks who attend and ask them if they would be armed when they come to church. Because short of instituting your own team, that may be the best approach. It's just going to be less reliable because sometimes those folks aren't going to be there. But, you know, if they're there 90% of the time or 95% of the time, well, then you've covered 90% or 95% of your problem. It doesn't make the whole thing go away, but it does help a lot. So, you know, I wanted to chat with you a little bit about the whole securing churches thing because with the church shootings we've had over the last couple months, we've had one now in September and one just about a week and a half ago or two weeks ago, this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, and it was one that um, I'm getting more and more questions about. So, And because, obviously, I tell people on my show that I'm a Christian, and they want to know what I'm doing with my church. Well, I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> just so that you know. That's the other thing. You don't want to you know, tell the whole world what you're doing for security at your church. What does they used to say in, uh, in World War II? Loose lips sink ships? Well, let's not do that, okay? So whatever your security procedures are, keep them to yourself. Now, obviously, if you want more help with this, uh, I'm open to helping. This is, like I said, a, passionate of my, a passion of mine. If I can give you some advice, I certainly will. You can just shoot me an email if you like. Uh, you can send it to, gunguy, to uh, gunguytv at gmail.com. That works. Or you can send it to joel at gunguy.tv. Either way, I'll get it. Uh, forgive me. Sometimes I get swamped with them, and it takes a little time to respond, but I will try to get back to you as quickly as I can and at least help a little bit. Maybe I can give you some ideas I haven't given you here. And frankly, if you have ideas that you think might work, then please share them in the comments because I'm sure there are other folks that want to know about this kind of stuff too. And by the way, in case you hadn't noticed, I did share this podcast openly and publicly because I think it's important for people to be able to see uh, what challenges they're going to face in their church. I think it's also important that as Christians, we come to the realistic appraisal of things and realize that the world is not necessarily a safe place that the Lord has protected our salvation. Amen. So we're protected eternally, but he may not, it may not be in his plan to, to protect us physically. And then we get to determine whether that's something we want to just sit back and hope for the best, or if it's something that we want to take on ourselves to protect us physically, knowing that it may be that the nutcase walks into our church. Maybe he, walks in, maybe he or she walks into yours or walks into mine. Each church is going to be different. That said, I think it's important for you to remember that criminals follow the path of least resistance. And if you put yourself in a position of being the church that is the path of least resistance, this is more likely to happen at your church than it is to happen at mine or others that have put together a security presence to defend their congregation. This is important stuff. It's important stuff that we need to search out in the scriptures, that we should pray about fervently, that we should talk about uh, you know, among the leadership of our church and, frankly, among the congregation. One of the things I discovered is that some of the churches I consult for, they, they work very hard to have a security presence, but they don't want to talk to the congregation about it. <gasps> oh, we can't do that. We'll never do that. So the congregation has no idea what to do if somebody walks in and starts shooting up the place. 
Now, we'll talk to the congregation about what to do if the fire alarm goes off. We'll talk to the congregation about what to do if the earth starts shaking or if there's a tornado or a warning or whatever. We'll talk to them about all these kind of things. But we don't want to talk to them about what happens if somebody walks in to bring violence to the church because we think that might be too frightening. Well, here's the problem with that. If you have a security team or you have a designated set of armed people, for example, in the worship service, in the worship center, and you got, I don't know, five, 600 people, 1,000 people, 3,000 people, 500, 200 people, whatever it is, somebody comes up the first round that goes off, there's going to be pandemonium in there. And your security team needs to stop the threat, but they can't shoot because everybody's running around like loonies. Whereas if they all knew at that moment, if this was your procedure, everybody duck and get down, then the one, the, the one remaining person standing other than the security team is the guy with the gun and the security team can deal with him. But if we don't tell this, the, the, the parishioners that, well, they're going to do what they're going to do. They're going to run. They're going to yell. They're going to scream. There's gonna, it's going to be lunacy and, and craziness, and they're going to panic and go wherever they're going. But we don't drill that. We have a fire drill. We have an earthquake drill. We have a tornado drill. We have a, a drill for drilling. We have a drill to drill the drill. <laughs> but we don't have a drill for violence. I think as churches, that's something we have to figure out. That's something we have to address. And that's something we eventually have to admit to ourselves as ministry staff, if we are, I'm not, but as ministry staff or church staff or elders or whatever, we have to admit to ourselves that this is a real threat to our congregation. And we have to admit to the congregation at some point that this is a real threat to the congregation. And then we have to tell the congregation that we plan to do something about it. We may not tell them the ins and outs of the security procedures at the church. We don't want to do that because then we're announcing it to the world. And if there's a nut sitting in the, in the congregation at the time, we've just told them what we do. But they should know what they need to do. If this happens, do this. Then it's possible for us to help you. Afterwards, when it's done, we're all going to evacuate here. Just like we know if somebody has a heart attack in the middle of the worship center, we need to get out of the way, stop service, everyone get out of the way, let the EMS folks have plenty of room to help that individual. And if we have a medical team or medical group in our church, get out of the way, let them deal with it while somebody, some designated person or persons is calling 911 to get help for for this member of our church who's in medical distress. There's no difference between that and the earthquake warning or anything else. And yet, Churches are terrified of bringing up this subject with their members and the people who attend. And uh, I got to tell you, as a security uh, guy, if you want to call me that, security contractor and uh, and a consultant, that that flies in the face of the reality of life in the United States now and in, in other parts of the world, and it flies in the face of the reality of the situation where churches are concerned. We have to start taking this seriously. We have to assign budgets to it. We have to get serious about it. And we have to keep our congregation safe. And if we don't, if we don't, I'm just going to say it this way. Now, if we don't, and a church decides they don't want to do anything about it, or they just don't want to do any, they don't want to focus on it. They don't want to assign any money to it. They don't want to take any steps to secure the church. They figure, oh, it's not going to happen. That church and that church leadership bears a significant amount of responsibility when the day comes that somebody walks in their church and kills their members of their church. Let that sink in. If you have the opportunity to do something about it, you should. If you don't, then it's on your head when something bad happens in your church. And you may not like that, but whether you like it or not, I'm here to just shoot straight with you. Either put up or shut up. <laughs> do something about it to protect your, your members or risk the fact that they may die if you don't. Anyway, that's it for the podcast today. Thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Have a wonderful week. Um, if you have any comments about this or questions about it or you want more information from me, just let me know. Um, this is, a, like I said, this is a passionate thing for me, and I, I really want to make sure that Christians and their churches are safe throughout the country. And I can't do it myself, but I can urge you to get involved with your church to help them be safe. And, you know, if you have questions, let me know. I'll answer them as best I can. Thanks again for watching. Have a great week. Have a wonderful holiday, and please be safe.